today. I'm talking to a room full of missionaries. We're all called to be missionaries. I'm speaking as one missionary to another. And I'm going to challenge you to step into being the missionary that God has called you, where you are, in what you're doing. And possibly even to tell you to go as well. Can I start with telling you that I, I believe that God wants to change our vision. He wants to change where we put our sights. In order to be a missionary, first of all, you have to be observant. And so God wants to change our eyes to see what God sees. He wants to change our ears so we can hear what God hears. And he wants to change our heart or our spirit to hear what God is saying and to see with spirit eyes. He wants to make you observant of your surroundings, not so you become overwhelmed by them, not so you get in despair like others around us, but so that you can breathe in hope. And if you've got your Bibles or your phones and you're not on them to text people, (laughs) open your Bibles, then can you turn to Ezekiel chapter 37? And while you do that, I just want to send greetings from Alice Springs to you. They're meeting right now in in the hall, in a school hall there, and um, very excited that that we can be a part of you as a family. And, um, yeah, they say hello and send their love. And, um, yeah, and, and, you know, we're really enjoying that we're a feeder church for you and sending in our uni students um, in Isaac and Sam George, you know. I know Adelaide needs our Alice Springs people, Joel Ken, the Osborne family. Man, how many people are you going to take without sending someone? Come on, guys. <laughs> At this moment, Chad is up there serving. Thank you for one week. We might not have a return ticket for him. Sorry, Charmaine. (laughs) He's been doing my role. I've been away and um, he got to be soccer mum yesterday. That was fantastic. Take my kids to soccer. He sent me a photo of him being soccer mum. I hope he cheered like I do. He better have. (laughs) It's great. He's doing a great job. He did youth last night with them and... um, Yeah, uh, there was new kids there. He got to pray with them. I'm looking forward to hearing if he led them to Jesus. If not, I'll be asking why not. Um, Maybe he has to stay till they're saved. I don't know. Anyway, let's get back to it. Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Now I said that we need to be observant and we need to see what God sees. Now when you look out in your schools or in your workplace or wherever you find yourself, are you seeing God God move in people? Are you seeing their spirit and seeing whether they're alive or dead spiritually? 
And see, God doesn't want us to just look in there. But as he, we look in there, the reason he wants us to see what is really going on is because he wants us to prophesy into there and bring in life. So we don't just stop and see the problem, but then we have to start speaking into that problem. Before we see change, and we don't just, oh Lord, yeah, I wish I could help them. No, it says to speak what we want to see. And so I say, start reading that chapter and believe you're going to prophesy to dry bones. Believe that you're going to see spirits changed. Believe that you're going to see God at work in people's lives. Can I say verse 11 to you? It says, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole city of Adelaide. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone and we are cut off. If you think of that like your city, that there is a hope that is missing, you have the answer to that. As a missionary called to Adelaide, you have the answer for that. When everyone else is fishing around trying to get funding to make sure they can make more programs and make sure everything is happening the way that it should be happening, that's not really going to bring about lasting change, you have the answer. And it doesn't require money doesn't require anything other than the love of Christ in you, the hope of glory, and speak it out. So we prophesy in. So we see, we allow ourselves to see how God sees. We allow ourselves to prophesy into situations. We begin to speak life over the city of Adelaide. We begin to speak life over the city of Alice Springs. We begin to speak life over Australia. So we want it to be changed, don't we? I don't want to stay in Australia like it is right now. Do you know, my city needs prayer at this moment. Well, it's a town, but I, it's city, close. It's got some shops. It's got Kmart. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Bargains, bargains. Our town is now called the most dangerous city in Australia. When I moved there, it was called the stabbing capital, but now it's, now it's the most dangerous city. I was pretty excited to hear that. I live in the most dangerous city in Australia. (laughs) But I'm not excited because it's a dangerous place, but I'm excited because I know that the power of God moves great in those places. It says where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And so I'm excited to see what happens when grace abounds. I am excited that I get to be a part of that story. And you get to be a part of the story of Adelaide. Or maybe Alice. Observe, prophesy, but you need something else. If you're going to be a missionary where you're at, you need radical love. Not just any love, not lust. I hear you've been talking about sexuality. We're not talking about that kind of thing today. Thank God I didn't get that topic. (laughs) It would have been a very different sermon. (laughs) But just, (laughs) yeah, no, I don't even think. Okay, so let's get back to love. (laughs) Radical love. Do you know what radical means? It means it's affecting the fundamental nature of something far-reaching or thorough. If you radically love, you are going to affect the fundamental nature of something. And what's that fundamental nature of Adelaide? You are going to affect it. If you radically love. How do I radically love in my place? Well, it's a good thing that the Bible tells us how to do that. So let's look at Romans. If anyone tells you the Bible is irrelevant, they haven't read it. It is so relevant in any situation. In Romans 12, it says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. 
If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The keys to you radically loving are all in that passage of Scripture. If you read nothing else this week, read that. And, you know, if you walk that out, you're radically loving. I challenge you to look at it and find one thing you find hard in there and work on that. Ask the Holy Spirit to, to bring it into you and to, He can make you, He can change your way of doing things. He can make you sincere if you're not sincere. He can make you hospitable if you're not hospitable. He can make you patient if you're not patient. And that's a really hard one. The keys are sincerity, clinging to that which is good, being devoted to one another, being zealous and passionate and joyful in hope, patient in pain. It goes on to say, bless those who persecute you. So different from the way that the world does things. So different from what we're taught in other places. But this is what God tells us to do. Yes, we're saved by grace, but because of that grace, we now can outwork a different way of living. And he's calling you to do that, to radically love people around you. That is what is going to lead people to Christ. It is love in you that is going to draw people. It is the love that you show your brothers and sisters in Christ so that other people are going to be questioning, why do they do that for one another? Why do they go above and beyond? It's because of Christ in them. You get to share your faith when you show love. People want to know why you're loving when everybody else is hating. You'll get to speak out things that you never got to speak before. Why did that person treat me that way? Oh, it's because Jesus showed them how to love. Can I encourage you to be radical lovers? Love the people around you. See the people other people don't see. Go and speak to those people. It's not enough that we see the people. Go and speak to them. Find out what's going on. Ask God to give you words of wisdom and knowledge onto what's going on in a person's life so you can speak into that before they even tell you. We have gifts available to us. Are you hungering for them? Are you asking for them? Are you speaking them into your life? Are you living a life of fear? Or are you living a life of love? Love radically extravagantly never stop never stop it says in 1 John 3:18 my little children let us not love in word neither in tongue but in deed and in truth when you love let it come from the depth of truth that you know that you are God's child and let them see that they could be God's child as well We can be observant, we can prophesy into something and we can radically love. But there's another thing that I think I struggle with. Love is, to love people sometimes is really hard and in our setting, our love can look very different sometimes. Like when people just constant, there's needs and they just keep coming at you, you can think that, oh, we have to feel that need and it says if someone's hungry, feed them and if someone's thirsty, give them a drink. And yet um, sometimes we've had to say no to feeding people and actually that's been a sign of love because we're going, no, you've, we've got to empower you to do what you need to do. So it's actually not that they're hungry because they couldn't get food, it's that they spent their money on something they weren't meant to spend it on. And I'm not saying we won't feed someone if they come to our door. We will. If we've got food, we'll give it to them. But we will try then. If they keep coming to our door, we'll say, well, hang on, what's really going on here? And we'll try to feel the actual need and not just what we're seeing in our face. 
Because otherwise we'd become tired and we become weary. And it says don't become weary in doing good. And so we have to think of another way of not becoming weary in doing good. And we realize that doing good in in the world's eyes isn't necessarily doing good in God's eyes. See, God wants to bring people into freedom and into truth and into life. And so he doesn't want people being in a cage of the same cycles that they've been in before. And so sometimes our love is going to look different than the world would say to do. So they, many people say, did you start a feeding program? We said, well, there's already a few going on in town. So no, we didn't. And they'll say, well, why don't you start a, a hostel? For some, I said, there's already, like, there's already at least six hostels in town. There's things to do there. But what is missing is people knowing the truth of the Word of God. And an amazing thing has happened to us just recently. Um, ben works for a few hours a week at Mission Australia as a chaplain for the staff. And um, a few years ago, they asked us to start a kids club for their kids. So we've been doing that for a couple of years now. And just in the last month, they've said they realised that their mission statement was about transforming the transformative work of Jesus Christ in people's lives. And they realised that they were filling people's needs, doing what we said, and they, but they were empowering people, doing an amazing job, teaching parenting skills and feeding programs, all the things that people say we should be doing, but they're doing them in this organisation. But they realised that what they weren't doing was feeding the spiritual souls of the people. They weren't feeding people spiritually. And so they had a hole there. So they've come to us and asked, could we please run a Bible study that they will prepare? They prepare the food for us. They prepare the venue. They've got all the things we need to do. We just need to turn up and preach the gospel, and I love that. Thank God we don't have to set something else up. (laughs) One day of the week we just get to rock in and then roll out. It's really good. And we had our first one this week on Tuesday and it was beautiful. We sat on the grass and um, all these ladies there and we got to have a good meal together and um, they just began to hear the word and they were hungry for it. And they just finished a money management course and then they came out and they're hearing the word of God and I'm like, that's how it's meant to be. That's transformative work. So Mission Australia have worked out that to be missionaries in their place, they need to feel not just a physical need, but they've got to mix it all together. We can't compartmentalise things. We often like to keep things separate, don't we? Especially in the Western world, we like to keep all things. But what I love about my Indigenous brothers and sisters is that they, they don't compartmentalise. All in, all out, or the ones that I've met, um, had the pleasure of meeting, I love that they are all about the spiritual, physical, emotional, everything's all together. And if something's out of kilter, it's all out of kilter, but at least it's all together and they're not trying to split it up. We're really good at hiding behind our mask and putting our makeup on and turning up and looking fine on the outside, where inside we're melting. If they're not fine, we know about it and that's okay because we can deal with that. And I love it. I think we should all be like that. Get rid of the fake and bring on some real, hey? God requires obedience from us. I hate that word. Well, submission more, but obedience as well. I don't really hate it, but I find it hard. It jars with my flesh. My flesh says, no, no, no. As soon as someone says you can't do something, I want to do it. But God wants to speak to your heart and he wants to say, can you be obedient? I'm going to ask you something and will you do it? And he doesn't want excuses. One of my friends, she's 85. When she was 25, she'd married this man who was a pastor. He passed away just after they were married. They'd been married only a couple of years. Never had children. And she was trying to find someone to take on the church. And she's asking these people, no, no, I can't, I can't, I can't do this. And so she found herself in a time when people didn't allow women to minister really effectively or out in the front. She found that she was the only one left to take on this church. And so so she became the pastor, just actually out of not being able to find anyone else. And she's still pastoring that same church today. She's in Sydney, a powerhouse. She plays piano accordion. It's pretty awesome. She was obedient. God said, well, you're going to have to do it. And she goes, okay. 
And she has walked through some full-on times and now it is pumping there. Like she speaks at the youth meetings and she's, yeah, I think she's 85 now. It's amazing. And she gets them saved. They're weeping at the altar. I'm looking forward to going visiting her soon. But, you know, she wants to write a book about something and it's something I want to say to you. She goes, I want to write this book and it's called Something Came Up. You know that story about the wedding and then they're saying, oh, can they come? Oh, no, 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 sorry, I just bought some land. Oh, I just, you know, the, all the excuses that they give. You're actually not being obedient. And some of you have given those excuses. Oh, well, let, let me just get my house sorted. I just want to, you know, I just want to make sure I'm financially secure and then I'm going to... And then I'm going to go and I'll be in the mission field. Or I just want to do this and then I'm going to do that. No, God wants you to be obedient now. His obedience is inconvenient for us. It is disruptive for us. Being a missionary in the space where we are means being willing to have our lives disrupted, our comfort diminished and our time inconvenienced so we can be obedient to God. Are you allowing where you are now for things to become inconvenient for you? Are you seeing things that come into your life? And I'm not talking about distractions. That's a different thing altogether. There's some things you need to get rid of and they're distractions. But I'm talking about things that God is putting in your path and you're not seeing it as those things. Are there things that you need to start saying yes to? Are you allowing God to disrupt your life? Because he will, and he wants to, and he will continue to do so. You don't want him to stop speaking to you just because you don't listen. Well, the thing is that God never stops speaking to us, but we can block him out, right? Don't block him out. Open your ears. Your spirit ears, spirit eyes. Let's see what God's saying in the space where you are. He'll put things right in your path. Some of you are finding it hard to be a missionary where you are right now. And that's because you're not in the right spot. God's told you to go somewhere else and you haven't listened. Whether it's out of fear, whether it's out of inconvenience, whatever it is, and you've said no. Guess what? It's not too late. Say yes. If you're still alive, if you've still got breath in your body, then it's not too late to say yes to God. Say, please, come again, God, come again. Say to me again, this time I'm going to say yes. We can't allow fear to be the thing that binds us. That's a thing of the world. If you're letting fear rule your life, if you're letting the world get you down, if you're letting the circumstances that you're in, if they're overwhelming you, then bring it before the Father. But don't stay there. Yes, circumstances come and they, and they push us down. It says we're hard-pressed on every side. Louise shared that yesterday. Louise Wabnitz was wonderful. She said we're hard-pressed on every side. But it didn't mean that she was abandoned or that she was left. She didn't stay there. She felt pressure. Yeah, she was pressed down. But she didn't stay there. She knew she could stand firm on the Word of God and you need to stand firm. And there's people in here that have said, I can't do it again because I'm hurt. I can't do it again because things have happened. I can't do it again. Well, he's saying, no, yes, you can. Because he doesn't, doesn't want you to do it in your own strength. I couldn't be in Alice Springs in my own strength. Well, I probably live in the golf area, the golf course area, probably not where, not Nicker Crescent. <laughs> If you've ever been to Alice Springs, Nicker Crescent is famous where we live. <laughs> the police go, oh, you live there. You know, we need the grace of God in our life. His grace is sufficient for us. His power is made perfect in our weakness. Fear, get rid of it. If you don't trust God, start trusting him. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. I want you to become observant. Well, I don't. God does. I'd love it if you're observant. But God wants you to be observant. He wants you to radically love because you've been radically loved. And he wants you to be obedient. There's three things that we can be obedient when we're being obedient that he'll call us to do. 
One is to stand. Sometimes we just have to stand. We don't have to act. We've got to stand. So stand and let God do the fighting for us. There's times there's a lady that spoke to me yesterday and she said, I just have to stand in what I know God said. I'm going to hold out. I'm going to stand and wait. Yes, she's right. In that circumstance, she's waiting for God's best for the situation. But there's times where you're standing where you need to be acting. And God wants us to act just as much as he wants us to stand. He didn't give us armour. He didn't give us the armour of God so that we could just stand there and look pretty in it. It's not pretty armour. It's for battle. And although, yes, some of it is defensive, there is an offensive weapon there and it's the Bible and we need to start declaring it over our lives, over the lives of our family and over the lives of this city. And there's actions that you need to be doing, even small actions like he might say, hey, go make that person a coffee. And you go, no, I want my own coffee. I want someone to come and ask me. Even if it's that small, you can be disobedient. Just start with the small things. Sometimes I find it harder to be um, obedient in the small things than the big things. Speak kindly to your children. Oh, but I just want to tell them off. Like, no. <laughs> Show Christ to your children. <laughs> and the third thing is to pray. We can't neglect to pray. If you're just acting and you're not praying, then you're missing out on the power of what God has. You're also missing out on the heart of what he says. Because praying isn't about us speaking, it's about us being in communion with God and it's about hearing, it's listening, it's speaking, it's listening, it's more listening than speaking. And it's allowing that to drop into your spirit. And then you act on what you've prayed on because you'll be praying the very heart of God.